The Corporate Governance Conference is an important contributor to the investment landscape in Saudi Arabia. During this conference, we announced the results of our Corporate Governance Index, where we rate all listed companies on Saudi Arabia's premier stock exchange, Tadawul, from a governance perspective. This serves to improve market efficiency and aids investors in their decision-making process. This year, we are hosting a hybrid conference with limited in-person attendance due to precautions related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Nonetheless, we are pleased to have two very prominent keynote speakers from the London Business School and from the University of California at Los Angeles participate via Zoom. The theme of this year's conference is ESG investing. This stands for environmental, social, and governance. It is an increasingly important topic where institutional investors that include large pension funds and asset managers are applying ethical and sustainability criteria to their investment allocation. This is a positive trend and corporations need to increase their awareness and sensitivity to this investor-led movement. Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum everyone here and uh, far away in Zoom. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulil Kareem. I uh, want to apologize for you for not starting at 6 o'clock sharp because, as I said, there were some issues here, even though they were ironed out this afternoon, but somehow things happened. All right, uh, Your Excellency, Dr. Muhammad al Ayaza, and uh, honorable executives and managers, our esteemed uh, speakers, uh, my colleagues, and uh, all our colleagues who are participating through Zoom. Assalamu alaikum again. Uh, we are living here the traditions which we used to for the last five years, namely this annual event. We would like to continue this annual event no matter what the circumstances are. Uh, last year, we started, in fact, a new history in the era of the corporate governance in Al Faisal University. And that we expanded it to make it international. And we had last year a full day of activities. The day time was for research and papers and practitioners and so on. And the evening was for the keynote speakers, the corporate governance index results, and the excellence awards for the corporate governance index. Uh, we wanted to do this this year. But again, uh, as they say, the wind blew against the sailor. So, but at the same time, we'd like to continue. And with the support we received from our uh, president, Dr. Hayazer, we decided to continue, but in a truncated form. So the day program, unfortunately, we could not uh, run it due to the difficulties of the COVID and uh, well, uh, in the evening segment is still the same as the previous uh, three years. And to sweeten the deal for you also, we try to bring to you something really contemporary, which makes a big difference. So we are, uh, the theme of the conference is something called ESP, Environment, Social Responsibility and Governance. This is the latest out there in the developed world, and they talk about investing using uh, those three uh, themes or these three spirals. Uh, and to make it even sweeter, we invited uh, the best you can find out there in corporate governance. We invited two top of the line scholars. One of them is, uh, was with us last year, Dr. Alex Edman. He is the head of the corporate governance in London uh, Business School and a professor of finance as well. He is the author of, he is the author of this book. I've got a flash on the camera here. Hopefully, the camera will pick it up to the audience. It's called Grow the Pie How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit. 
And we promised Alex that we will acquire this book and give it to you for free here. Uh, we did order the copies. The copies did arrive in Saudi Arabia, but they went to a demand through FedEx rather than the Riyadh. And uh, it took a while to clear them. We are on the way. But inshallah, we will send them to you. Uh, then we also have another scholar, uh, Dr. Alfred uh, Osborne. He is a professor of economics and entrepreneurship. And he is also uh, the chairman of the Price Entrepreneur and Innovation Center in Anderson School of Management at UCLA. Later on, they will be talking to us. And with that, let me go to the agenda, which what you will see in the coming two and a half hours. And inshallah, there will be light hours, and they will move very excitedly, uh, very fast. Uh, what we have here. OK, keep going. All right. So this is the agenda. You have now a bag. And in the bag, there are uh, certain good things. First, there is the agenda, which you, you see up there. And very soon, we will give the floor to uh, Dr. Mashur, where he will make a brief presentation on the rationale, the objectivity of the work we do to determine the corporate governance index and the lessons we have noticed in the last three years and how uh, companies and the culture of corporate governance start to catch up. And indeed, it's showing in the performance of many companies. After that, then we'll move on to an exciting session where the two speakers will be with us. We'll start with uh, Dr. Uh, Alex, who will speak for 25 minutes, then to Dr. Alfred, who will speak also for 25 minutes, then we'll open it for questions and answers from here, as well as from uh, the Zoom colleagues out there. Then after that, we will uh, distribute the uh, award, the excellence awards, uh, our president is with us here to help us uh, hand uh, those awards to you. Inshallah, when your name comes up, you will come up here and uh, make the award and have a picture for the memory. And after that, Inshallah, there will be a social hour and we ordered uh, food from some of your best caterers in Riyadh, at least based on what we know. Uh, and uh, before I go further, I would like also to recognize my colleagues who work so hard in the center. And sometimes we keep at the end when we are in a hurry and we forget about them. Uh, we have Dr. Mashur right here. You will see him very soon on the stage. He is the executive director of the Corporate Governance Center. We have uh, Dr. Najati. He is the head of the research department there in the, in the center. Then we have uh, Ms. Khulud uh, Al-Harbi, where are you, Mr. Khulud? Khulud right there. And then uh, also, Mr. Rada al Sheikh, both also work uh, as a team with us. And uh, inshallah, sit back, enjoy, and inshallah, you will have a great time. Before I go, I would like to bring to your attention also a very important booklet right here. It's in your bag. This has the history of the development of the Corporate Governance Center in Al Faisal University. And the last page is from page 18 and on. It gives you a brief on the sequential annual conferences and the theme of each one of them. And with that, I call on Dr. Mashur Murad to the floor here, and he will start his presentation. For the presentation, please keep your questions and answers. And at the end, there will be a session, as you see in the agenda, for uh, for that. With IT for you.
Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm going to try to stay close to the camera for the Zoom audience to hear me because there, there's this mic here. We have this other mic here for the audience that's uh, uh, in presence. Uh, I have quite a bit of slides to go through, but some I'll go through quicker than uh, others. Um, so this is the second International Corporate Governance Conference. Uh, we're at Al Faisal University, for those of you who are on Zoom, uh, uh, in, uh, in Riyadh. So we're gonna start with just uh, a little bit of an overview of the Corporate Governance Center. It's uh, in its fifth year. Uh, so it started in 2016, uh, there was a, a generous grant given from the Saudi Arabian General Investment Authority to uh, start the project. That authority is uh, in charge of uh, promoting uh, investments in the country, inward investments, including foreign direct investments. And it was like a three-year grant. Uh, in each year, uh, there was a conference. This is the fifth uh, in a series of conferences. So uh, I've been with the center for, this is my second year now, and this is our second conference, and we have some uh, very good uh, information to provide you with. And you can see here uh, pictures from the earlier conference. Uh, and you're here we have uh, one of our uh, professors that was uh, Stephen Davis, who was a consultant uh, from Harvard uh, for us in helping develop our uh, governance rating model, along with uh, an existing company that uh, called Cobureate that does credit ratings as well as governance ratings. What's uh, uh, unique about uh, our uh, uh, rating is that uh, we adapted to uh, the regulators' uh, 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 mandatory uh, uh, regulations over here, as well as some other advisory uh, regulations for uh, listed companies. Uh, this really took on a, uh, a large momentum once uh, these uh, governance principles were, were updated and uh, there was a, you know, a, a really uh, strong mandate to uh, improve uh, the governance, the transparency, the disclosures uh, requirements uh, across the country. Uh, and it was uh, very helpful. I think it was driven by uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, Vision 2030 uh, that was uh, announced and it was, uh, it called for really reforms across the board in, in, uh, in many ways. And, uh, uh, and, and this is one of them. Uh, this is a picture you can see from our uh, last year's conference where we had uh, two keynote speakers here, uh, Professor Alex Edmonds and Simon Osborne, who's uh, an expert at board evaluations. So this is, uh, I'm gonna again, uh, go a little quickly through this. Uh, we have an assessment department, research department, uh, and a training and education uh, component to what we do here uh, at the center. Uh, of course, the, the big real thing that we do uniquely that uh, no other uh, organization does uh, in the kingdom is the development of uh, an annual uh, governance index where all listed companies on Saudi Arabia's premier stock exchange, Tadawul, are rated by us on, from a governance perspective. Uh, and we will be announcing the results and showing some, some comparisons uh, of where the index, 
what direction it's been moving over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, these are some of our other services that we do. We do provide individual assessment reports for companies who would like to know a little bit more uh, about themselves uh, and about uh, our process. Uh, so we do offer that service and it's uh, available on our website uh, exactly what we do. Uh, and uh, there's a whole list of other you know, things that we do as well. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the index. And I think this is what uh, a lot of the people who are in attendance over here are uh, interested in uh, knowing. And we will talk a little bit about uh, our methodology and uh, you know, how useful it's been. Okay, uh, we did give uh, a little bit of a background already. Uh, about how uh, it started. Uh, one of the things that we capture, okay, uh, we have a, a model and it originally started with over 400 variables that we look at uh, across a, a wide variety of uh, different categories. Uh, we look at structures, policies, processes, and practices. And uh, they're all grouped into four main key categories. These are the board of directors. So we have a lot of variables that deal with that. Shareholders rights, that's another category. Public disclosure and transparency, yet another. And stakeholders rights, finally ending with that. And we'll go into more detail about that too. Okay. Uh, Corporate governance involves a set of relationships between a company, its management, its board, its shareholders, and other stakeholders. Corporate governance also provides a structure through which the objectives of the company are set and the means of attaining those objectives and the way in which performance monitoring is determined. Is determined. And uh, this is really, really one of the benefits we're gonna uh, see throughout this is uh, in an era of KPIs and performance measurement, uh, the CGI or corporate governance index really uh, uh, helps capture that. And we're gonna show you uh, in some later slides uh, how that is. Okay. So some of these things, like I said, I'm gonna go through a little bit, you know, uh, uh, quicker than others. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you already have a background about, you know, what this is. And I wanna tell you just a little bit more about uh, what we do. Okay, now obviously uh, corporate governance is important. It's been in the headlines, uh, international headlines. Uh, uh, it's uh, been the driver uh, for, you know, a lot of uh, reform movements. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's a means by following good corporate governance uh, practices to try to minimize uh, risk, minimize uh, fraud, minimize uh, just the severity of uh, problems when they do happen. Problems are inevitably going to happen, but we don't want a whole disaster where you know the, the whole company you know just goes under, like what happened with WorldCom and, and Enron. So, uh, so that's why you know after you know a series of uh, uh, large scandals that were systemic, because a lot of people were affected uh, by them, um, uh, reforms in, in corporate governance. Uh, uh, took really an added uh, degree of importance. Okay, we're gonna talk here now about our uh, model. Okay, uh, so, uh, so in 2017, uh, our model started with, we started with 117 variables we assessed only the top 92 companies listed in Tadawal, and 
we awarded a few companies uh, 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 based on our uh, methodology. The standards in 2017 were a little different. The CMA have not yet updated their, uh, you know, uh, principles, uh, adopting more uh, of best practices from uh, OECD uh, and uh, making sure that they blend in with where the Saudi market is at the time and uh, with uh, our uh, particular local uh, needs, cultures, and where we're at. But there was a big breakthrough once those uh, uh, principles were, were updated and uh, some of those were made voluntary, but some were mandatory. There was definitely a lot more disclosure requirements and uh, getting companies to uh, accept this new culture of uh, 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 more disclosures and uh, uh, more governance processes, uh, exposing, uh, acknowledging conflicts of interest, uh, minimizing them, And, you know, uh, and on and on, you know, there's a whole, you know, uh, uh, list of things regarding not just disclosures, but also with uh, uh, board functions and uh, board uh, qualifications and committees, uh, uh, et cetera. And uh, uh, there was progress in year two, continued progress uh, in uh, year three, and while we did have three to 400 uh, variables, again, every year we continue to, uh, you know, update our model and uh, make sure that uh, variables that were, uh, you know, uh, not really uh, uh, helping much in terms of explanation. For example, there was compliance across the board on it or something like that, but we, we, we really didn't need it, you know. And finally, where we're at right here is we have a model of 225 variables for all of the listed companies that are not in the financial sector. Uh, we have an, an added set of variables for the financial sector, which includes banking and insurance. Uh, and the reason is they have also, in addition to the capital market authority, they have uh, another primary regulator, which is the Saudi Central Bank, uh, and they have their own additional requirements. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move a little bit, you know, uh, quickly, you know, through some of these, uh, you know, self-explanatory slides. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, getting into uh, the actual model. Now, uh, corporate governance index and Vision 2030. Okay. Uh, just, okay. We believe that it's absolutely essential to develop a sound corporate governance index to monitor and promote good governance among Saudi corporations with the Vision 2030 objectives. We believe good governance is a key to success for companies in the increasingly global competitive market. Uh, good governance also provides assurance for uh, long-term profitability and sustainability. And we're gonna be talking with the theme of this conference when we're talking about ESG, the word sustainability is gonna be uh, coming up uh, a lot more. Sustainability and the purpose of uh, corporations and I know Professor Alex will probably elaborate uh, a lot more on this. Uh, good governance gives a positive signal to international investors. Uh, and in fact, you know, when, when we talk about international investors, uh, this was one of the uh, you know, key drivers of uh, uh, Vision 2030 to open up Saudi Arabia to foreign investors uh, as well as uh, domestic and uh, to really be an integral part of the international community. And uh, we have made some good strides in there. Uh, Saudi Arabia is now uh, part of 
uh, several uh, major emerging market indices. Uh, this happened in 2019. Uh, and uh, what comes with that is, you know, a commitment uh, uh, to measure up to uh, international standards. So where somebody who wants to invest in a local company, well, uh, they're familiar with uh, uh, our accounting standards, our reporting, you know, on, on companies uh, and just across, uh, across the board. So, uh, will have the right amount of disclosures that they need to evaluate whether they want to you know, invest or if they're currently investors, whether they want to continue to hold or to sell, exit their position. So these are uh, really uh, uh, you know, uh, very important. And so disclosure is key of uh, all material you know, information. Okay, uh, again, uh, I guess, you know, every year we do talk a little bit about, you know, how we've uh, built the model. Uh, we expect that there's, you know, new people uh, coming, uh, uh, you know, uh, to look, but I'm just going to try to move a little bit more into the uh, uh, results, you know, for, for this year. And uh, and when I do talk about the results, I'm going to talk about uh, 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 some of the key aspects of our uh, model. So uh, our uh, uh, governance model uh, is evidence-based, okay? It's not based on a survey or that we send to executives and ask them to answer. It doesn't work that way. Um, it's it's evidence-based. so. Uh, when we have variables, we look at it and we want to make sure that uh, we can answer it. So if we can, we need to be able to find that information, whether it's in the company bylaws, uh, whether it's on their website, whether it's in their regulatory filings uh, on the Tadawal, the stock exchange website, uh, the timing of those uh, disclosures to the General Assembly, uh, all of these things. But we also give companies a chance if we don't find uh, things, we do write to each company and ask them that we can find these information. And those companies that do respond, uh, uh, you know, are rewarded, you know, in, in the ratings that they've made more, you know, uh, disclosures. So we don't have to mark them zero. It's uh, generally a one zero type of uh, 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 scoring, you know, on these different points. Okay, now this is also something, uh, and I think we can show it right here. Um, it's a weighted score. When we're talking, we're talking about a weighted mean score. So uh, each of the four categories, uh, public disclosure and transparency, board of directors, shareholders rights, stakeholders rights, uh, they're scored on a zero to 100 scale, but then to get the overall total score, uh, uh, we weight them. So for example, public disclosure and transparency is given a 30% weight. Board of directors, 35% weight. Shareholders rights, 25% weight. And stakeholders rights, 10% uh, weight. Uh, just like you'd see in any academic institution, uh, you score above 90, you get an A. Uh, above 80, you're going to get a B from 80 to 89, C and D and F, as uh, you'd expect. And uh, this shows the 225 variables that we did talk about, uh, which is uh, the, the current amount in our base model for all uh, non-financial uh, companies. Uh, this shows how many variables we have in each category. So in public disclosure and transparency, we have here uh, 78, uh, I mean, 71 variables for our base model. Banking, remember banking and insurance are financial and they have you know, additional variables. So in this category, banking will have seven additional variables insurance, another three. 
and and so forth. This is uh, how it is, how it's uh, uh, split. Uh, the key regulators uh, are the Saudi Capital Market Authority and the Saudi Central Bank. Uh, Okay, so I'm gonna move a lot, lot quicker right now because I think we're limited in time due to the late start. And uh, uh, this is just an example right here uh, of one variable and how we score it. Now, uh, uh, this, this is a variable that deals with board of directors and their oversight over executive management. Uh, this is a question. So uh, the board has reviewed and evaluated the performance of the executive management. We need to see that there's evidence that they actually did that. Okay. The board has developed succession plans for the management of the company. Okay, we need to see if they did that, there's evidence, and then we score it accordingly. Uh, sometimes uh, scores are split, and so that's why you see the 0.5. Uh, there's an AB part or something like that. And uh, and uh, we do score uh, higher for the voluntary, you know, especially if there are regulatory uh, uh, requirements. Uh, we, we can split them and uh, assign scores of less than one, but we do uh, award more for the uh, above and beyond regulatory if they're gonna comply with uh, or adopt some uh, uh, additional voluntary uh, uh, governance best practices. So I'm gonna move quickly here. Okay, now we're into the index. So this is what's new for this year. Our cumulative score for all of Tadawal was 79.86. We're just barely scratching right there on, on the B category, okay? Uh, and this is based on a score of 77.27 for public disclosure and transparency, board of directors, 79.98, uh, shareholders' rights, 78.39 and stakeholders uh, rights 45.44. Here's a summary of some of the statistics. Uh, so here we have the overall score of 79.86, okay? And, uh, and we have the same scores that I showed you in the previous graph, but we have additional information. So in addition to these mean scores, we have median scores, you know, for uh, those of you interested in the, you know, power of statistics. And we also note the standard deviation. So once you have a larger standard deviation uh, coupled with the mean, it really, you know, uh, weakens the relevance of that mean or tells you maybe it's not all centered around the mean. So that statistics gets a little bit less power. Now we do have one category, shareholders' rights, where we had a very small standard deviation of four around the mean of 78, which tells you that uh, uh, this, this score of 78 uh, is uh, you know, very uh, meaningful. And we can see that there's a lot of sensitivity towards shareholders. So we have the original uh, uh, mindset of uh, you know, companies responding primarily to their shareholders. And here, look, we have maximum scores. So the highest score was given a 99.36. So we do have companies with very high, uh, you know, governance ratings uh, this year. And the minimum of, of 56, which also is uh, not too bad as a floor uh, for the overall score. Now this shows from 2019 to 2018. So, so there was a jump here. There was a jump of about almost 11%, 10.5% in 
moving from uh, last year to this year. So there's uh, improvement almost in every category. When you look at here, even though we have a low base for uh, stakeholders' rights, uh, it's still a 20%, 21% improvement over last year, but there's a lot more work to be done here. And if we look over a three-year period, we still see a continuous trend improvement year on year. But last year, we've seen a bigger improvement than in you know, previous years. Uh, key observations. So as I was saying, the corporate government index improved by over 10.5% over the prior year. There was improvement in each category. Stakeholders' rights showed an improvement of 21%, but it's still at a low point. And as we're talking today about ESG, and we're talking about uh, especially the S part in the ESG, and which we do capture you know, in our model, and that's why it's, it's right here. Uh, social which deals with uh, uh, employees, customers, suppliers, uh, society and the environment and community. Uh, uh, as we move and as the world is moving more from a shareholder centric to a, a stakeholder centric, that uh, still not a deviation away from shareholders, it, it still incorporates them as a stakeholder, but given sustainability uh, and sensitivity to these other stakeholders, their, their due share uh, in attention. And uh, so uh, uh, our keynote speakers will be speaking uh, a lot about this. And uh, uh, so just want to identify that. Nonetheless, we have improved, but uh, this type of conference and this investor-led movement of uh, focusing on ESG is going to be uh, uh, helping to drive uh, that, that goal. Now here, uh, again, I'm gonna go uh, a little quick, but in addition to just one statistic, a graph, like a, a histogram is gonna show you some uh, uh, distributions. Now- Can you skip the conclusion to this? Because we didn't. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, so uh, these are just pretty much some additional uh, information. I think I covered most everything. But one other thing I did, did want to mention, like in terms of measurement, okay, what the CGI, what the uh, index allows companies and regulators and, and people to see is a way to measure that there has been progress in governance. We've seen this uh, one typical company in 2017, they had a score of 65, moved to 73, and now they're going to be an award winner at 97. Uh, this, this progress is attention by a listed company uh, to governance and giving it really that type of focus would not be captured if it wasn't for the index. Who would know? So it, it, it's important uh, when, when, when we're measuring and we're you know, letting the world know and, uh, and we're gonna see ESG investing, the G people, uh, large institutional uh, investors want to, uh, are willing to pay a premium for those uh, companies that have better governance within any sector. That, that's an important criteria for them. Uh, this also shows uh, uh, that same company uh, and, uh, uh, and its improvement compared to its sector. So when it was at 65, it was actually underperforming its sector in governance, okay? And then it exceeded the sector as it was instituting, you know, uh, best, better practices. And finally, now it's way above its uh, sector. Sector improved, they improved more. Again, these are things that we, we capture. The whole food and beverages industry, we can see that a whole sector has been moving upwards. Uh, again, this is something, one of the beauties of uh, uh, the CGI, the index. And hopefully we intend to expand uh, our practice to cover GCC companies, not just uh, Saudi Arabia. 
uh, to Dowell and family businesses as, as well. Thank you very much. Okay. How do we transfer to his video? Uh, okay. I can put this slide. The number for us, so you can have the opportunity to find him 25 minutes to be ready. Okay. Could he not come over? So I'm going to have maybe he has to control it. Okay. Sorry, guys, for the question that I saw, took time here. But maybe you know, I think you'll have time to go ahead with the questions that I asked. Come over, come over, come over. Come over. Uh, Alex, uh, uh, can you hear me? Um, I can, Monsieur. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, unfortunately, I can't start my video. It says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. So whoever's the host needs to enable uh, me to share my video. Okay, uh, we'll have our IT people try to uh, work on that right now. Uh, at least we do see our slides, so that's good. Oh, I think we got your video up here now. Absolutely. Um, shall I get going? Uh, well, let, let me introduce, uh, I mean, I think uh, uh, Professor uh, Badges, uh, our dean, uh, made an introduction. But uh, actually, if I did your full uh, introduction, you know, it would take probably a, a full half hour because uh, you're such an accomplished person. But uh, let me just go a, a little bit briefly. Uh, 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 Professor uh, Alex uh, studied at the MIT Sloan School. And that's where he got his uh, PhD. He did his undergraduate at Oxford. He did a stint in investment banking uh, with Morgan Stanley well before uh, uh, moving into uh, uh, academia. So he does have a, he's uh, very, very uh, uh, well published. Uh, so not only the books, but in journals. He's published in the American Economic Review, Journal of Finance, Journal of Financial Economics, Review of Financial Studies, the Journal of Economic Literature. He's the managing editor of the Review of Finance, associate editor of the Journal of Financial Economics, a research fellow for the Center of Economic Policy Research. Uh, I think it's important that they know, I mean, your research credentials because uh, when you talk about your findings, you know, it's, it's based on rigorous academic research. This is not just somebody saying, oh, well, we think, you know, that this is the right, you know, uh, course or the right answer. It's, it's based on, on, on rigorous fact. Um, he is a faculty research fellow for the National Bureau of Economic Research. He won the Moskowitz Prize, Prize for Social Responsible Investing. Uh, the FIR Prize for Finance and Sustainability, the Investor Responsibility Research Center Prize. I mean, just the list goes on. I can't, you know, con uh, continue. Uh, uh, his research has been covered by, you know, uh, Wall the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, the New York Times, The Economist, uh, The Times, Bloomberg, BBC, CNBC, CNN, uh, even ESPN, okay, uh, has, has covered uh, uh, his research. Uh, uh, he's, you, you'll see him on, on, on YouTube. He's, uh, uh, he has uh, uh, TEDx talks and uh, TED talks. Uh, so anyway, I, I just wanted to, again, the list just goes on. I would be uh, talking, you know, for a very long time. So let me go ahead and ask uh, Professor Alex to uh, uh, give us his uh, lecture. Well, thanks so much, Monsieur. It's great to be here. It's great to, to partner with the Corporate Governance Centre again. So I was uh, very kindly hosted by the centre two Decembers ago. Um, I was in the audience when um, that um, the Corporate Governance Index of that year was announced. And it was just so, um, so encouraging to see this index being produced and one which is based on research, which is something that Professor Murad was highlighting uh, in his introductory remarks. So what I want to do is to talk to you about um, corporate governance, 
what is it and uh, does it matter? And you might think, well, why am I choosing to speak about this? Because don't we all know what corporate governance is? That's why everybody's here. And does it matter? Well, obviously it does matter. Uh, that's why we're attending this event. But what I'd like to do is, is based on research, actually suggest a slightly different perspective on corporate governance to what people typically think about. And in terms of does it matter? Well, certain dimensions of corporate governance do matter but other dimensions do not. And so this is why it's important to have an evidence-based approach, which is indeed the approach that the index is taking. I saw there was an earlier question about, well, making materials available. I will be very happy to send my slides to, um, to the Centre for Distribution afterwards, so there's no need to take notes. But let me start by explaining, well, what is corporate governance? And let me give you an example of what people thought was a sign of really bad corporate governance. It was a couple of years ago in the US. Um, Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, was said to be paid an obscene amount of money. People said he was being paid $66 million, which is 1,424 times as much as his employees. And so people accept that CEOs are talented, but 1,400 times that just seems to be insane or absurd. And why would we care about this in terms of governance? Well, for two reasons. First, directly, this costs a lot of money, which otherwise could be spent on investment or worker wages. And the second is indirectly, if there's such high inequality within an organisation, that could demotivate employees, maybe customers would boycott you for all of those reasons. However, Right, we do need to look at evidence and there's almost two sides to every story. What was interesting here was actually um, Disney had performed really well. So in just the one month prior to the announcement of his pay, Disney's market value had gone up by $75 billion. And you might think, well, corporate governance is about the long term, as Professor Murad was highlighting. But even if we looked at the long term, if we looked at what had happened since his appointment, in 2015, actually, the company done really well. Its total shelled return was 578%, whereas for the S&P 500, it was only 140%. Now, we don't just care about shareholders. As Professor Murad highlighted, right, we do care about stakeholders very seriously. But in fact, the profits to Disney were not at the expense of, shareholder, of stakeholders. In fact, the company had created a lot of value for them. So it had created 70,000 jobs since uh, Bob Iger became CEO and customers benefited. So they benefited from great products and services like Avengers Endgame. So it wasn't because they were extorting from customers. OK, so this is really important because we often think about bad governments being splitting the pie differently. Too much for the CEO means less for investors and less for stakeholders. So we often think about it as being a fixed pie. We want to avoid things like this where the executive gets too much. So if so, well, what does good governance? It's splitting the pie differently, making sure that the orange goes up. But in fact, that's what not what I think is the most important facet of governance. It's not splitting the pie differently. It's instead caring about the size of the pie. So let me give you a different example. So let's take our minds back 40 years ago. Um, and let's say that you're the CEO of, of Kodak. Now, 40 years ago in 1981, Sony, your biggest rival, uh, launched the Sony Mavica, which was the first ever digital camera. So how do you respond if you are Kodak? Well, Kodak had every opportunity to respond they actually held a patent for the digital camera. Do you want to see what their digital camera looked like? It looked like this. So it's not as sleek as the digital cameras that we see today, but they did have a patent for it and they had every opportunity to respond. But they didn't. Why? Because they had two short-term horizons. So their own head of market intelligence predicted that digital cameras would replace film but it would take 10 years and that was too long for the CEO to care about. Why? Because they were being paid according to short term earnings. So we know what happened in the end, right? Kodak went bankrupt. That was a disaster for society. 
right? At its peak, it had been worth $31 billion that got wiped out and 145,000 employees lost their jobs. But what is really striking here is that this was really thought of as being poor corporate governance, right? The CEO or the executives of Kodak are never given the same anger that Bob Iger of Disney received. They never saw them as being bad, badly governed. Why? Because it wasn't the case that executives and investors benefited at the expense of everybody else. Everybody lost because Kodak underperformed. But actually, the fact that executives and investors lost out is of no consolation to the 145,000 people who lost their jobs. So what I'd like to see bad governance as is shrinking the pie where everybody loses out rather than splitting the pie differently. OK, so what good corporate governance involves is not just splitting the pie fairly, even though that is important, but growing the pie, ensuring that companies remain innovative and productive. And so this is one of the key aspects of making sure companies are well governed. So I see, um highlight this, right? We first want to create value for both investors and stakeholders. Then we need to ensure that the gains are fairly distributed, but the primary responsibility of investors and boards is to make sure that companies create long-term value. Okay, so the second part of my talk is, well, does this actually matter? Well, I've defined corporate governance as growing the pie, but, well, there's loads of other ways to create value, right? Good marketing, good production. How important really is corporate governance? And the important thing here is to be extremely rigorous about the evidence, which is something that Professor Murad was, was highlighting and I really appreciate. Why? Because of this danger of confirmation bias. So what do I mean by confirmation bias? This is the idea that people have their pre-existing views of the world, and they will be very quick to accept evidence that supports their view, but also they'll dismiss evidence that opposes their view. And because many people do believe that corporate governance matters, they might be willing to accept any piece of evidence that shows that it's relevant, and even if that evidence is not that rigorous. And so this was the topic of my TED talk that Dr. Murad, Professor Murad mentioned, what to trust in a post-truth world about being really stringent with the evidence. So what I want to do for the next 10 minutes or so is to go through what I see to be the most rigorous evidence on court. Some surprising results that might actually be inconsistent with what we previously thought. Before I get to that, let me go to one example of the importance of rigor. So I'm taking Forbes, which is obviously a very respected outlet. And what they wanted to highlight was the importance of stakeholder orientation. So they refer to a study which found that companies that excel in sustainability and responsibility outperform their peers financially. Okay, there's nothing wrong at all with that. But here's the concern. The next slide. That is the premise of a new report, and it is an accurate one, judging by many conversations with those interested in better business, better governance, and a sustainable future. So how did the journalists judge whether the report was accurate? Not by looking at whether it was published in the world's top journals, not by looking at the methodological rigor or the scientific accuracy. She just asked people who believe in governance, do you think, well, governance matters? Do you think this report is right? And obviously they would say yes. Okay, so what I want to do is to look at the most stringent evidence to avoid this problem. And so let me start with perhaps the most famous paper written on corporate governance by finance academics, which looks at various things that companies can put into place in order to insulate themselves from shareholder oversight. Okay, so um, one of these things is a staggered board. So this is a way in which you can make sure that the board is difficult to kick out. The board is something where you're only elected once every three years. There's a golden parachute, right? The golden parachute is a way of making it difficult to kick out the manager without paying them a lot of money. 
and there's a poison pill which prevents them from being taken over. In fact, there's 24 different devices that companies can put in in order to insulate themselves from shells. Now, you might think this insulation is really bad. It means you're not accountable. But there is a flip side, right? So that flip side is actually maybe these ways of protecting management are good, right? Because if management does not need to worry about shareholders, then management can think for the long term rather than having to manage for the short term. So what is true? Are these devices good or bad? Well, what we do as academics is we say, let's look at the evidence. And so this paper was published by professors at Harvard, Stanford and Wharton. And what they found was that well-governed companies, so companies without these protection mechanisms, they beat poorly governed firms by eight and a half percent per year over a nine year period. And so this is one of the big papers which really made ESG investing mainstream among investors. Corporate governance matters, and so this is why the index that Professor Murad showed is something to be taken seriously. But there are some twists, though. And so this next slide shows the twist. Corporate governance doesn't matter in every single situation. So what this paper by Giroux and Muller looked at, they're from NYU Stern, another top university, is they said, well, maybe corporate governance does not matter if you're in a competitive industry. Why? Because if there's a lot of industry competition, the CEO will have to work hard, even if there's bad governance. So what they're saying is it's only in the non-competitive industries, let's say utilities, that we need to care about governance, because that's when the CEO has a tendency to slack off. And so this is very important because it means that we don't want to take a box ticking approach to corporate governance. Yes, we would love to find a company which has great financials and a great management team and great competitive positioning and great governance. Sometimes we fight, can't find a company that ticks all four boxes. And actually some cases, governance may not matter so much if there are other things such as industry competition to ensure that the company is maximizing value. Okay, there's another paper here, but it's just in the interest of time because we started a bit late, let me skip that. Now what I want to get to is executive pay. Why? Because that's what I um, opened the talk with. And so many people, when they think about executive pay and how is this good or bad governance, they look at the level of pay. So too high pay relative to everybody else is seen to be a bad thing. Indeed, in a couple of US cities, uh, they, they tax you if your pay ratio exceeds a certain amount. And this is based on some evidence. So a few years ago, I was testifying in the UK Parliament and the witness before me said there was a study finding that firm productivity is negatively correlated with the pay ratio between top workers and our bottom workers. So the idea is the greater the inequality within a company, the worse the performance. Why? Because people are um, demoralized. However, we need to be really careful because as I said in the start, evidence can sometimes be flimsy. And actually what this witness quoted was a half finished paper. Right. In order to get papers published in the top journals, they need to be peer reviewed to check their methodology. And in fact, the published paper, when it came out, found completely the opposite result. So when they went through peer review and had to correct their mistakes, they found the opposite. Actually, high pay ratios are correlated with better performance, not worse performance. And why? Well, the reason is because of the Disney reason I mentioned at the start. If a company performs really well and generates high long-term returns for both shareholders and stakeholders, then if pay is linked to performance, then pay should be high. And this is what's borne out in the data. So if the pay ratio is not the relevant thing, what is the relevant dimension of pay? Well, it is the horizon of pay, whether it's long-term or short-term. And this is great because this is what's supportive of what's in the index. So again, in the interest of time, let me skip some of it. Let me not talk about my own paper. Let me talk about somebody else's paper. So let me talk about the second paper here. So what this paper looked at 
is what happens when shareholders vote for a proposal for a company to pay executives according to the long term. Now, one of the dangers here is, is it correlation or is it causation, right? Because if shareholders vote for a long-term pay proposal and performance goes up, you might think, how do we know it's the proposal that's causing the better performance? It might just be the investor being there and the investor being really engaged, which causes the performance because the investor is monitoring. So what they do is something called a regression discontinuity. So this involves taking some proposals for long-term pay that pass with 51% of the vote and those that fail with 49% of the vote. So the idea is whether you succeed or fail, whether you're 51 or 49, that's random, right? Because if it was a large engaged investor that came in, they would increase the voting support to say 70%, not 51. And so what they found was that when these long-term pay proposals come in, profitability goes up, innovation goes up and also various measures of social performance go up for the environment, customers and society and in particular employees. So what this highlights is the best way to make sure that the company serves wider society is not to cut the CEO's pay and give it to everybody else. It's instead to pay the CEO according to the long term because if the CEO knows that he will be paid according to the stock price in five or seven years time, then he will have to do things such as invest in his or her employees, invest in innovation and treat stakeholders well. And that's going to go into just some of the final um, top topics here on the S and E of ESG. So this is one of my own papers on the importance of treating stakeholders well. Now we typically think that if a company treats stakeholders well, it's at the expense of investors. But in fact, the evidence suggests it's not the case, which is why in what Professor Murad said, there's a lot of stakeholder concerns in the governance index. So what my paper looked at was companies that treat their employees well, as measured by their inclusion in the 100 best companies to work for in America. Now, we typically think of the pie as fixed, anything you give to workers is at the expense of shareholders. But I showed it's the opposite, right? When you invest in your workers, it grows the pie and shareholders benefit because workers become more productive and more motivated. So these companies outperform their peers in stock returns by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28 year period. And obviously I need to do tests to suggest it's employee satisfaction that causes better performance rather than better performance causing employee satisfaction. But because I want to get to Professor Osborne, let me just not go through this here. Um, just take my word for it that I control for that. So instead, let me go through my the final um, study, which is again an important nuanced one, which is about the importance of materiality. So what do I mean by materiality? Now, as Professor Murad was saying, stakeholder capitalism is the buzzword of the day. We need to serve wider society, customers, the environment, employees, and so on. However, we can't serve everybody because then we would be all things to all people. We'd be scattered and unfocused. So what good corporate governance involves is knowing what are the stakeholder issues that are most material and focusing on them and perhaps deprioritizing others. So what this looks at is the materiality map, which the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board introduced. This goes industry by industry to highlight who are the most important stakeholders. So if you're in the first column, extractives and minerals processing, clearly the environment matters because you have a big impact on it. But if you're a bank, well, your direct effect is not that high. So maybe what matters more is selling practices and product labeling. We don't want to be in a Wells Fargo fake bank account scam. And so what the study looked at was it took data from MSCI, which is perhaps the best known ESG data source. And it looked at companies that did well across the board. They did well in every ESG dimension. And they found that those companies did not actually beat the market. They only beat the market by one and a half percent per year which is insignificant. Now, when they redid this with a materiality lens, looking at companies that did well on the material issues, but scaled back on the immaterial ones, then they did beat the market by 4.8%. 
So this is striking because it suggests that it's better for companies to do well on only a few things than to do well on everything. Because if you're doing well on everything, then you might be forgetting about your shareholders. So a truly purposeful company is not one that is all things to all people, but one that focuses on the issues that are most material to them. Okay, so just to, to wrap up, um, I just released a book about this last year called Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit. And so why I did this is because it's on the topic of corporate governance and responsible business, but it wants to be based on evidence because there's a lot of myth floating around. Now, unfortunately, a lot of this academic evidence is written in academic language just to be stuck in an academic journals. So I wanted to bring it to life with some real life examples and frameworks and write it for practitioners and, and kind of at uh, the centre um, has obtained copies of this book for all of the people in physical attendance today, um, but because it's still stuck at customs, it will be distributed to you after, um, after the event. But hopefully this will be a, a relevant guide to people wanting to practice good governance. And on the website here, I put for free a lot of developments that have happened in corporate governance after I finished it. So thank you so much uh, again for the uh, attention. Thank you to Professor Murad and the Centre for inviting me. Uh, let me um, hand that back to him and uh, to hear from uh, Professor Oswald. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Wonderful, wonderful lecture. Really appreciated it. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back to you during the Q&A session. So uh, let's see if we can uh, get uh, Professor Osborne. Can you send a question through the chat? Oh, uh, any questions, uh, please send them through the chat and then uh, Professor Najati will uh, uh, look through them and then uh, bring them to our attention. Okay, we see Professor Osborne, his uh, computer is working, uh, beautiful UCLA background behind him. Uh, can you hear me, Al? I can. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So uh, let, let me let me introduce you to the uh, audience. Uh, uh, I know Professor Badges uh, made an introduction, but let me just give some additional background. Uh, uh, Professor Osborne is the Senior Associate Dean for External Affairs at the UCLA Anderson School of Management. Uh, he's also a professor of global economics, management, and entrepreneurship. He's the founder and faculty director at the Harold and Pauline Price Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Uh, I'm going to also say you, uh, Al started his academic career at Stanford, where he got his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering. He has two master's degrees from Stanford, one in economics, one in MBA, and he's got a PhD in business economics also from Stanford. Uh, his academic career has been all, always at UCLA, where he joined as an assistant professor and has uh, uh, been there uh, since. Uh, he's actually an experienced uh, board director himself. He's sat on the boards of several Fortune 500 companies, including Times Mirror, uh, Nordstrom, uh, many others, uh, many other uh, uh, not-for-profit boards uh, as well. Uh, he's led many initiatives. Uh, his research uh, is uh, 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 gets into private equity, uh, venture capital, uh, uh, values. Uh, all all that is uh, uh, very important. He has a broad sense of uh, uh, research, uh, diversity, and the value of cognitive diversity. Uh, uh, the acceptance of different viewpoints. Uh, so diversity is not just demographic, but it's also a diversity of uh, minds and ideas. Uh, uh, again, I can go on and on and on for long accolades uh, of his, uh, you know, uh, illustrious career, and we're, you know, very uh, honored and pleased to have Professor Osborne speak with us today. Um, thank you, uh, Monsieur. It's um... A pleasure uh, to be able to be in this this setting, uh, and I'm I'm glad I had an opportunity to hear some of what uh, Professor Edmonds had to say here. Uh, very much appreciate his perspectives. Uh, I remember that that literature, 
Um, I'd like to, uh, let's see here, begin the process of sharing my screen. It's early morning in Los Angeles, so you can see the daylight behind them. It's evening down here. <laughs> Yep, so we'll just do that up here. Let's see. Um, Good, that worked. Did you get it? Yes. And now uh, here's the... Uh, Okay, I assume everybody can see uh, the first page. This is titled the, the Corporations and the ESG Imperative. Um, uh, and so assuming then that um, we all uh, have eyes, I'm going to begin my presentation. Um, the agenda I've chosen to talk about today is really deal with these two, two purposes here. I thought it was a good idea to revisit the purpose of the corporation. Uh, what is it that a corporation really is supposed to do? Uh, and in that, in that space, it's good to remind ourselves about the value imperative and the current concern, uh, which has raged for a long time, frankly, uh, that pits quote unquote shareholders versus stockholders broadly expanded now, and I don't have it written here, to include stakeholders. Uh, we we want to come back to that uh, and a couple of things I'm trying to highlight here. Uh, and then the question about what directors do, keeping in mind uh, for the public corporation today in the world, it's fiduciary duties really matter. And as a sitting director in companies that have to deal with issues like the carbon footprint, uh, and environment and sustainability issues, uh, they matter increasingly a lot to our shareholders. Which then takes me into the second part of my chat, uh, which is uh, 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 talking directly about the ESG imperative. Um, the, uh, I, I assume a, a lot of this, those in the conference will have a good idea as to what ESG is, but uh, uh, I have chosen to put a, a little image on the right, which really tries to handle uh, uh, what um, uh, the intersection is uh, that people are talking about, uh, both of the environment, uh, social matters, and governance. And when you cut to the chase on that issue, ESG uh, is really something that good corporations have worried about for a long time, but uh, you could say that the environment part of the E deals with the planet, uh, and therefore we got such things like uh, uh, the UN uh, uh, development uh, uh, standards uh, and things that we're trying to get to. Uh, um, social, the blue part of here in this picture deals with people, and we're finding that there's some major issues here that particularly here in the United States that have been exposed as a result of um, uh, things like uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, things like uh, uh, the defense and related issues uh, of how systemic racism affects uh, the, the kind of inputs and outputs we see and how they are distributed. Uh, and then finally, the notion of governance, uh, which speaks to profit. So the, the three Ps are still essentially what the S ESG is all about. Uh, the planet, uh, its people, and given how we've organized to produce goods and services in our society and improve the social welfare, profits. Uh, and let me say for a moment that profits matter. Uh, I'll get back to that in a second, but. Uh, I've always added a P when I think about these three P's and the P I add is philanthropy. In the United States, philanthropy is an important leg to solving a lot of the issues, particularly the intersection of these issues. Uh, and I call it the fourth P. Uh, philanthropy can only occur if there are profits. There is no philanthropy 
unless there's profit in a free or primarily a market economy or the mixed economy live here. And I've come to appreciate that. Uh, Monsieur talked about uh, the boards that I've been involved with over my business career, uh, but I'm currently uh, chairman of Fidelity Charitable, uh, which is the largest charity in America. Uh, and it is associated with Fidelity Investments. And from that position, I have been able to see with what we do, uh, the, the, the importance of philanthropy to making the intersection of uh, SEG something that's alive and now viable. The firms can, can grow the pie, uh, but it doesn't happen fast enough. Just simply, if you're an economist, you remember things like Edgewood's Bowley, Background and you know and sort of when you kind of get to the core, uh, you really do need growth and and that was uh, a comment that Professor Edmonds made that I think is absolutely essential. Growth really matters, uh, and so ways in which that can be enhanced will solve these issues and make them converge. But there's a big force working now, and it has to do with investors and the investor stewardship prerogative I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, under the auspices of what I'm going to call responsible investing nowadays. In the Anderson School, uh, our MBA students are totally fired up, and this generation is totally fired up about uh, these kinds of returns. Uh, I'm going to just mention a little bit about the business roundtable. Uh, 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 notion and corporate purpose. Uh, I think it's instructive that the largest fund manager uh, be someone we pay attention to. That's BlackRock's Larry Fink, an Anderson MBA, uh, who I think is getting it right. Uh, looking at his recently received or, or released KPIs and his standard letter and some of the financial implications. But I don't want to forget a disciplined that exist in the investment community, uh, such as activists. Uh, and, and to the extent that we can get the timing right, activists play an important role in disciplining managers uh, that may not be value maximizing as we would think. And then uh, hopefully, I know we have limited time, uh, so I will move this to click a little quickly here, should there be questions and answers that you might want to entertain. So let's just think about what is the purpose of the corporation? Now uh, we've pondered this a second. Well, my view here is the corporation exists, as I indicated, to produce the goods and services that are in demand in our society. They assemble the supply factors, and if they do this right, they have margins and profits. And who gets profits? Well, those who risk capital in whatever form are absolutely essential to this game and they must earn a return. And if there is no return to capital that's deployed in a particular activity, uh, there is uh, limited philanthropy. Uh, and unless the government intercedes, a lot of the things that fall into uh, the S category or the, the E category uh, don't, don't get done. So, uh, but the purpose then of the corporation I believe then is to make money. So then what is the purposes of directors when you're talking about making profits? Uh, well, a model that uh, this is, uh, this is a, not exactly the uh, a, a thing that needs to be elaborated, but allow me to provide you with a description of what it is I believe a director must do. Uh, and since this is a governance seminar, we need to define what the role of it. I think that the directors are entrusted primarily to oversee the operations of any for-profit private corporation to be sure that its goals are consistent and aligned with certain objectives and policies that promote value maximization, doing so by being fiscally responsible, keeping management accountable, and making sure that we carry out the mission. Now, uh, 
as far as academic papers go, I think uh, another important paper beside the Gumpers paper that Professor Edmund mentioned is going way back almost 20 years to the value maximization stakeholder and the corporate objective front paper of Michael Jensen that I thought was a particularly powerful piece some 20 years ago. Uh, Jensen tried to rationalize uh, the issue, the debate that has been going on for some time of the purpose of the cooperation. Is it to satisfy stakeholders or some group of actors in the production process, or is it to satisfy shareholders by maximizing the value of enterprise. Uh, and, and in his in his in his piece, he had an opportunity to talk about uh, stakeholders and some other approaches. Uh, and he concludes by letting us remember that uh, in the end, if you're talking about a scorecard for managers, uh, the best scorecard is whether or not they are producing value at the highest level possible and are singularly focused on that to the neglect of other issues. Now that has always uh, impressed me uh, because at the same time, if you're maximizing profit, you really can't do that if you ignore the interests of your stakeholders. Uh, and all great companies have value statements that talk about in wonderful language about this interest of trying to rationalize value maximization for shareholders in terms of investment returns and uh, a workplace or culture that values people, suppliers, customers, and talks about them in very elegant language. Uh, I've always liked the Johnson & Johnson credo, uh, which to me uh, speaks about these issues. And when uh, 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 this organization was started uh, by the Johnson family and uh, General Johnson, uh, I believe, um, uh, had uh, is credited with putting out something that J&J calls its credo. And it goes something like this. Um, if, if we take care of the nurses and doctors, that are taking care of our patients. And we take care of our employees who are producing the goods and services that our doctors and patients need, uh, that our doctors and nurses need to take care of our patients, our shareholders will earn a fair return. So what we have here is a reminder that it's an alignment of interests all up and down the line that makes it possible uh, for of the people who believe in value maximization as the principal purpose of the enterprise uh, in, its, in all of its form, thinking of the capital stack, whether it's equity, debt, or other kinds of securities and other products is an important alignment. So the focus has to be is, are we aligned with our purpose is to make and produce the largest possible value for whatever it is we have elected to do. They may talk about that perhaps in discussion because value maximization to me, I think is particularly important. But for that to happen, a board has to be effective. So the effective board must be able to provide what I'm gonna call informed advice to the management, honest oversight, and it must assure the future. And if we were to sort of drop down the, 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 the and break it all down to two things. Boards have two important responsibilities that I embedded in that description I gave you. One is to be sure you've got the right CEOs and, and you promote and take care of him and or her uh, for what it is that they, they have to do. Uh, and that's where the incentive function of compensation and, and uh, executive compensation comes into play and issues of succession of choosing the right person to be head of the ship. And then the second thing is the strategy that is assuring the future. As you provide monitoring and advice, are you also paying attention to how the purpose of the enterprise is being actualized to generate returns? And assuring the future means some involvement in strategy. But the board is not expected 
to manage the enterprise. That's why you hire management, but you're supposed to be able to make the right kind of involvement. And I like to think about that, uh, making sure that directors are independent, that they are careful in their duties, uh, loyal, they're attentive, they're curious, they're skeptical, they're working in a deliberative body, uh, they're collaborative and decisive. And when they come to decisions as they must as a group, everybody obeys. That is why I believe the best boards behave according to uh, uh, something that we call NIFO. That is to say, they keep their noses in what's to be done, but they keep their fingers out. Uh, this is not an accounting term. Some people confuse it with the, uh, the next in, first out uh, inventory issues in the accounting profession. Noses in, fingers out. And to me, that's the real test of a board. Being able to manage that with a group of people who are your peers and make sure that the corporation does what it must and stays out of trouble in that process. That's the difference as being careful and loyal as very important. And if you do that, you'll be blessed with the business judgment rule. Uh, to me, this is an important foundation for what the boards have to do when they start thinking about spending corporate resources uh, to satisfy uh, ESG type of concerns. And there's a litany of them uh, that um, um, uh, the board may have to may have to be considered. I mean, just think of trying to satisfy all the uh, sustainable development goals that the UN put forth. Uh, how you engage in all of that at the board level. And a lot of it is what can you measure uh, from the accounting sense. Uh, now there's efforts to move along those lines and I'll get to that shortly, but the business judgment rule is particularly important. So now that I've kind of shared with you my reminder, there are folks that I don't care about that. And nowadays uh, boardrooms are populated that this graphic tries to give you a sense we have on a somebody on a soapbox from ISS uh, trying to tell this particular board how to vote. So if we think of your companies uh, and, uh, or here in the United States, what is, is this the future for your board? Do you want to be told by some group, whether or not it's academics or, uh, or consultants uh, who uh, uh, can say how you should vote or not? Uh, I, I am not so keen uh, that that's the way we want to go. Uh, the purposes whose voice really needs to be shared is those who have provided the capital for the enterprise to do the purpose for which it was intended. So investors, now investors sometimes use these folks as proxies uh, to be uh, basis. And I, in my career as a director, particularly in most recent years, I've had an opportunity to talk to many of these consultants uh, because they are rating companies. And some of these ratings uh, are sticky. Uh, as you can saw, some of the indexes and others uh, try to say that folks who do these things do better. And most of that research is flawed in one way or another, uh, just from the various challenges we face uh, when trying to be uh, scientific about some things that are very difficult uh, to get good measures on. But that, that's okay. I think we need to improve the science to be better, but we gotta be careful that it is our decisions in the boardroom that matters and that this may well be an input to what we do, but it shouldn't drive notions. Uh, for example, let me take something that uh, is particularly important to many third party observers uh, that um, boards, um, uh, the, the staggered board is a bad idea. That is the notion of directors uh, serving, uh, being elected every three years as opposed to every year. Uh, to, to me, that's the same kind of short-termism uh, that those that would believe in long-termism talk about. I happen to think that, uh, that a, a, a staggered board can actually protect shareholders' interests better. Now, I say that yeah, the evidence is mixed, but it seems to me that that's something that ought to be, and we shouldn't willy-nilly react that boards should be elected every year. There should be a turnover based upon what people like ISS or Glass-Lewis or any of the number of advisors say. That's something we can talk about. Now, uh, 
I, I, I'm mindful a little bit of of our time here, uh, and but but I was given uh, roughly uh, thirty minutes. So I think I have six or seven more minutes <laughs> to go forward. But I, to me, it was important that as directors uh, and interested in governance, we remember the foundation principles. But the question now. Is it possible for corporations to be successful, make a profit, but still do good in the world? I think the answer is yes. Now, good, I put in quotes because it depends on what it is we think good is. And that now becomes a value judgment and it's very subjective. And as an economist, I think we ought to be careful in whether or not we impose our value judgments uh, on others uh, and, 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 and sort of this is the issue that we often face. Uh, you know, let the shareholders have their returns and they can decide how they want to spend it. Uh, this is a, uh, if there's, uh, if there's a, an issue here to think about. But I often kid uh, about my students who are interested here in impact investing, for example, and ESG. Uh, they believe they can make a profit and still do good. Um, a lot of money was made, let's just say, doing less good uh, in the years of me as a uh, baby boomer. Uh, and so now the millennials and the generation Y and Z and whatever are have the charge now uh, to clean up what we did, particularly when it comes to the environment. And that seems to be uh, a driving force and that's okay. So I think you can quote unquote, do good as it is defined from time to time, because there is a, a long cycle on how things are are called or not called and of course we know what these things are in terms of the esg factors that are important uh when we come to e the big one today is climate change i'll say a little bit about that greenhouse gas emissions and of course the question of water uh i uh for years i was a director of the largest water company in the world and we uh, we sold it to, to another company but uh, we could see the scarcity of water and the need how water had to be manufactured, uh, quote, pure water as opposed to regular water because of the impurities that exist. But there's no more water in the world than there was from the beginning of time. It's just a question of what form it's in. Uh, and the question and is how can, we, how can we improve some of these things, the sort of waste and pollution. Social issues are hitting us right in the face today, a whole question of working conditions. Uh, child labor, uh, indigenous communities have been neglected and exploited uh, both in America and all other parts of the world. And the European record here is not good historically, but it needs to be redressed now. How do we deal with all of that? Repartiations, uh, better working conditions. Uh, how do we deal with a serious attack and a serious effort to redress the social injustices, like we're trying to deal with in the environment. And then of course, governance, and this is where a lot of the focus has been. So the issues there have always been things like executive pay, conflict of interest, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, to give you an example, who goes to jail. And now increasingly, it is believed that broader diversity and, uh, and the way in which the board organizes to do its works, being say, perhaps more inclusive and more equitable uh, in terms of the distribution of uh, the residual value of the enterprise to the so-called stakeholders as opposed to others, maybe one way of beginning to approach that. And you can't forget stack strategy because governments has an important role to play in all of this, these factors. So these then are uh, what we have to keep in mind. And I'm just gonna jump over this because it's ESG impacts directly. And the focus has been with such things as SAAB and some of the uh, uh, some of the new uh, uh, consultants that uh, are trying to develop standards of how one should report and what they're doing uh, is the focus is on the financial, the chief financial officer of the enterprise and the finance function, because that is where uh, auditors and so on have a role to play, and investors in trying to understand the scorecard, uh, which is of course the income statement and the cash flow and balance sheets, how all of that is all about. So there are three kinds of risks that are important here that are indirectly affecting 
performance. We have to worry about the operations risk that speaks to the, some of the carbon and so on. And then the supply chain risk, that is who is in, who is being fairly treated in the plots like labor, for example, then the product risk are, are, are what we're offering. Uh, the products that we might offer are safe. And so some issues of safety, the product risk, the supply chain risks are the key risks and we don't, I don't have time to get into all of them. Uh, neither do I have time to get into what I think is the, the key core here. Uh, and, and I put forth the, 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 the principles, the PRI is one group that has come up with principles of responsible investing. And as you will see and perhaps are familiar with, uh, it incorporates ESG issues in the investment analysis. So there's an effort here that if I'm gonna invest uh, as a fiduciary now, I'm gonna invest the resources uh, that have been granted to me in company A or company B, are these good companies? Uh, and, and we're seeing that there is increased interest uh, uh, in that. Um, and so there are other principles speak to what makes for things like transparency and disclosure uh, and uh, adding as investors, raising the level and changing the culture in such a way uh, that um, people bet on the right things and they are inclusive in how they do these things. And uh, as I indicated earlier on, transparent. I think the biggest player in the world here uh, is the largest fund manager and that's headed by Larry Fink. And BlackRock has uh, some KPIs that matter. Uh, in the right hand side of this slide, uh, something I took from their, their website, uh, you'll see uh, the five things they worry about. Uh, they worry about <clears throat> board quality, the environmental risks and opportunities, corporate strategy and the allocation of capital, uh, issues of compensation, making sure you believe in long termism is what they call, and issues of managing the human resource. Uh, I think that. I, as I try to extract, and as I've listened to uh, Larry Fink from time to time, uh, the issues of quality speak to some of the concerns we can go in a little bit more. How the board is organized, uh, is there independence, uh, independence thinking, uh, do they evaluate themselves and management and so on uh, in a responsible way and do they have the time to do it uh, and so on. So that's important and as a lead director, I am well aware of those duties. The environmental risk and opportunity really speaks to, I think, the, uh, the whole question here of can we get to a world, uh, for example, in the industry I'm engaged, one of the industries I'm engaged in, with sort of the issue of carbon, uh, the greenhouse gases, uh, are all these part of our corporate strategy that we take into account the externalities uh, that these things produce? Uh, and, uh, and we figured out ways to internalize them, but I think we're making progress. So the whole notion then is how you allocate capital uh, to um, uh, working with all of the factors that are necessary to produce value over the long term. And the way you might want to do that is to be sure uh, that um, you compensate to promote long term ism. Um, the uh, Key considerations then uh, I, I um, want to point out here is the conversation by investors like BackRock and State Street and Vanguard and even the public pension funds uh, is summarized at the bottom of this slide. The board and workforce diversity consistent with local market-based best practice is a key concern when these investors talk uh, to companies. They want to understand if we as uh, directors understand the key stakeholders and their interests, and they want to be sure that um, there are plans to alive uh, with the global goal of uh, net zero greenhouse gases emissions by, by 2050. Um, Monsieur, uh, I know I think I'm up against the time. Right, yeah. But, uh, um, I, I, this is the danger you have with professors who don't want to give up any other slides. Uh, so uh, I would just quickly go to make a, a I'd say the discipline that can help all of this is thinking about what activists can do in the capital reallocation uh, as they 
worry about issues of governance and operational change. And they're good activists and they're those activists that are just interested in short-term profits. And we have to be careful with how those alignments work. And so I want to conclude uh, by saying uh, ESG is here to stay. Uh, the priorities will change, but it will be the investment community, I think, uh, the so-called impact investing uh, that will uh, affect uh, the fortunes and the alignments of all the factors in the supply chain from customers uh, to suppliers uh, and get and keep the board then disciplined uh, in what it needs to do. Uh, thank you uh, for your attention and I'll turn it back over to uh, Monsieur. Uh, I had a question, it might be uh, uh, a little bit of a different topic, but it's to, to Professor Osborne on, uh, uh, given your relationship with uh, Johnson & Johnson, do you have any idea when their vaccine is going to come out for COVID? <laughs> the vaccine? <laughs> yeah. Um, we hear it's supposed to be the I, I am I am not privy to that information, but I'll be glad to speculate with you. Uh, I'm hopeful that by the end of the month uh, we'll see them in distribution. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 Professor Alex, uh, maybe this is a good time. Uh, you you skipped one of your research that you want you were going to talk about. Uh, perhaps you could, uh, you know, share with us uh, uh, a, a little bit more about that. I think um, it was, uh, absolutely, I'd be delighted to do that. And before I do that, I just say uh, there is a, a real a huge amount of what Professor Osborne said that really resonated with me. It was a real pleasure for me to listen to him. And what's interesting is that we come from slightly different perspectives. Um, and, and, um, we're in different departments, management versus finance, and we didn't coordinate, but there was a lot of overlap. And why I say that is because the paper that I skipped was in the importance of the long-term horizon that <laughs> Professor Osborne uh, was mentioning in his talk. So what I wanted to do in this paper is to look at the effect of short-term pay on a CEO's decisions. So you might think, well, a way to look at that is to look at, well, when a CEO sells his or her shares, does he or she cut investment? But that's a correlation. It's not necessarily a causation. It might be that, okay, the firm's prospects are bad. If the firm's prospects are bad, the CEO sells her shares. And she also chooses to cut investment because you don't want to invest if your prospects are bad. So what we needed to do is to do something to get to causation. And so what we looked at was equity vesting. So what do I mean by this? So let's say three years ago, in February 2018, I was given some shares with a three-year vesting period. So that means that I have to wait three years before I can sell those shares. Now, the lockup expires in February 2021, and typically CEOs do sell their shares when they vest. Why? Because they want to diversify their risk. And so what we found was that in quarters in which the CEO has a lot of equity coming due, they typically cut research and development, they cut capital expenditure, and they just meet analysts' earnings targets. So that means that they focus on the short-term financial factors, not the long-term stakeholder factors, which are important for the company's shareholder success uh, in the long term. So this suggests to the extent to which we want to re reform pay, it's not so much the level of pay that matters, but the horizon of pay. <laughs> That's a very interesting uh, point, um, uh, Professor Edmonds. And um, uh, I've grappled with that uh, on the whole issue of the, the LTIP versus the short-term intensive plan and what kinds of programs exist that encourage long-termism within a compensation arrangement. And uh, what we find is if you put um, some directors, and I don't know whether or not your study looked at this, on a 10B1 plan uh, where they can trickle out their shares over time and agree to it, uh, whether or not that mitigates the risk both to him or her or the signals uh, that the that the that the come market might get as to whether or not there is um, cap uh, no capital being allocated to projects 
uh, all other things the same uh, by trying to isolate uh, this variable. Uh, this is uh, ad hoc, but it would be something worth investigating and seeing as how you're, you're working on that paper. What does a 10B1 plan do as a variable? Uh, do you get the same effect or does it um, actually take out uh, the risk that um, long-termism in capital allocation is compromised? Yeah, thanks very much, Professor Olson. I think that's that's a really interesting point. And particularly if the 10B1 plan leads to not this lumpiness, but your exactly. sale is, is being smooth spread out. out. Yeah. Yeah, so whenever you have lumpiness, what you have huge incentives to boost the stock price if you're selling a lot of equity at one point, whereas with 10B1, you pre-announce this and you say, well, I'm going to sell at some certain point for liquidity reasons. And if, if that is indeed spread out, that's going to avoid the lumpiness, which causes you to want to manipulate at one particular time. Thank you very much for that. Um, Professor Matt, I'm aware that there's a question on the chat. Um, oh, okay, that's yeah, probably for Professor Osborne to, to answer that one. Okay, let, let me put it up. Can you see the, the chat, the question? Yes, I can, I can see the chat. Okay. So given it's on diversity and inclusion, uh, I think you're probably best uh, to answer this. Yeah, yes, okay, it was flickering. I got, I got it right diversity now. Diversity and inclusion, uh, you know, I, I just want to put... Uh, yes. Uh, uh, mention something. Uh, yes. Uh, well, we know that, uh, uh, I mean, theoretically, that diversity uh, is supposed to uh, contribute to deliberation, uh, which helps uh, directors meet that their fiduciary duty uh, with regards to uh, 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 de deliberation and, and, and the business judgment rule. Uh, so from your experience, I mean, uh, have, have you seen that diversity uh, and uh, uh, actually uh, work and contribute to that? And, yes. and, uh, and is it, uh, and what percentage of that is gender or racial diversity uh, or geographic background or, I mean, or, or age diversity? I mean, can you maybe... Uh, just that shed some light on that. Since sure, I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be glad to do that. I mean, um, here we don't have any, uh, yeah, we don't have that. It's not on our radar. We're still a growing economy. So uh, uh, it, it, it's, it, it needs to be a long-term goal that we need to build to because we don't want to have tokenism. You know? So we want to avoid Well, the, the, let, let me say this. Uh, you have to start somewhere. In my view, what you want to have in a board is of a diversity of opinion. So uh, to me, and that comes from people that have different ethnicities, different but different life experiences matter if you're going to have what I call cognitive diversity. That is uh, what you're looking for in a boardroom. You really want folks, not everybody needs to nod their head and agree with what's being proposed, but you need to have healthy discussions, particularly when you're talking about allocating capital to Project A or Project B and Project uh B might be, say, buying back stock, uh, which is always a signal that maybe there aren't good fortunes or good projects available on an organic basis. And so all of that has to be taken into account. But the numbers are not very good. In California, we have two laws now uh, where at the level of the boardroom, uh, uh, the, uh, there's, a, uh, there's, there's a strong effort to improve the number of women in, in, in the boardroom, and it has happened. And the numbers are moving up, but they're still less than 25%, uh, and the uh, uh, underrepresented minorities are, are also uh, being asked to be on board. And those numbers, the Latinos and the African-Americans are still low uh, by these standards. Uh, uh, I, uh, in a couple of the boards I'm involved with right now, I'm engaged in the whole question of repopulating and refreshing the board owing to retirements. Uh, and uh, our priority is to try to identify uh, directors who come from these classes uh, that, that have, uh, aside from competences, these sort of skills that will make them collegial and contributory into the boardroom. Uh, and so, yes, it's happening, but it's happening slowly. Uh, I hope that answered your question, but I believe that uh, uh, the, the, big, the big issue here is people will say, well, we don't have enough to choose from. But part of that means that you need to do something about inclusion 
uh, at, at the, at, at the, on the professional ranks. Uh, we see that with people uh, from these groups, uh, women and uh, minorities getting better educated, they're going to find schools and so on. Uh, they're developing careers that will allow them to that. But I think uh, it's very important that you have uh, diversity uh, at, uh, in the management and in the business ranks so that people get comfort will change in the culture. And that's the problem of the tectonic shift that we have in this country right now uh, that's represented by uh, uh, the political climate where um, uh, 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 there are those that uh, are not necessarily excited about what the long-term trend looks like uh, in, some, in some issues and are objecting. Could, could I chime in a little bit here? I think this is, is a really important question. Obviously, Professor Osborne has much more experience of this at the boardroom level than me, but I'll try to shift in a little from, from, the divert, from the committees that I sit on. So I sit on the Responsible Investment Advisory Committee for Royal London Asset Management. So we run um, a number of sustainable investment funds. And I really uh, endorse the importance of diversity of, of thinking. So it just so happens that the four-person committee has two Asian men and two females. So we have both ethnic and and, and um, gender diversity, <laughs> but, but, what, but what really matters is, is not that sort of I'm Asian, but that I am a professor, we also have there an investor, we have also an ex-corporate person who was the general counsel of Unilever, and an environmental specialist, so it wasn't just ticking the box of having females and minorities, we have a diversity of, of, of backgrounds, but also the procedures that we go through try to encourage a diversity of opinion, so what one of the things that the committee does is that if the fund wants to invest in certain companies, it will assess its ESG record and say whether it should be included or excluded. And we have the briefing note, which has all the analysis of the analysts, um, which we will read and then scrutinise. Now, it used to be the case that the analysts started by saying, oh, we think that this is an include, and then sort of gave all the reasons, and some were pro, pro some were against, and then overall, yes, it's an include. But then that in, in automatically encourages us to anchor on the original recommendation. So if we see that the analyst has said, oh, I think it's a yes, or I think it's a no, then we read the rest of the report bearing his or her decision in mind. So one of the small things we did was just to change that so that we still have the decision, but that comes right at the end. So we've read the entire report with an open mind, not bearing in mind what the analyst thought of, and then we say at the end whether we agree or disagree. So there's a few things like that in order to try to encourage um, a cognitively diverse views. Uh, thank you, Professor Alex. Uh, one, uh, I have another question on, on ESGs, if we were uh, talking about this. Um, what type of ESG disclosure uh, uh, regime would you like to see that would be you know required of corporations to make the disclosures to allow the asset managers to make their evaluations based on that? Sure, I'm happy to take to, um, take this first. So I think um, the the problem with a regime. So I, I know that there's a lot of call for harmonised metrics, and so the World Economic Forum has just proposed this set of metrics, and and I know that investors do like something which is comparable. But the issue with that is that there are many ESG issues that are not comparable because what ESG involves is should be specific to a company. So um, this is the point of the materialist study that I mentioned. So there are companies, let's say um, Olam, which is the Singaporean agribusiness, they will measure the income uplift to the smallholder farmers. And if you're a retailer, human rights and the supply chain, those are really important issues. So um, I, I think it, it sh should be certain things which are tailored to a specific company's purpose and ESG risk. There are certain things like climate, where carbon emissions, they do matter across the board. And so I do think there are some universal things, but I also do think there are some particularly tailored metrics that companies should say, well, this is our purpose. These are the ways in which we're going to measure it and report on it. And so we need to make sure that some things are tailored, even though the trend towards one for size fits all is often quite compelling um, for, for some investors because it leads to more comparability. Uh, th thank you, uh, Alex. And uh, uh, one final question, uh, Al, you, you talked about staggered boards. What we have here in Saudi Arabia is only staggered boards. I mean, uh, uh, would you like to, uh, is, it, is it healthy to move towards where you get, you know, half the companies uh, 
because once you get more activist shareholders, they definitely like to have annual elections. Uh, and, and, and they do you know, put some more discipline or more pressure on management. Uh, but I can see that you know, insulation that a staggered board gives you like you know, uh, to, to be more long-termist instead of short-termist, it, it gives you that relief. Uh, is it a case by case basis? Uh, is it what, what? What are your uh, thoughts on that? Um, um, it's a very good question, I'm sure. And um, uh, I have um, I have believed that um, on balance, uh, it's an individual thing, uh, and if it, it, and it really depends as you look at all of these factors on uh, the purpose and performance of, of the company. Uh, it is quick to to say that a staggered board uh, uh, doesn't uh, uh, allow for the right kinds of investments in growth and innovation, or they are, I mean, it's, there are lots of reasons why uh, it can sometimes work. So you have to be careful with how you, and uh, how you sort of, sort of say it's a bad thing or a good thing, because there are a lot of flaws in most of the studies that look at this thing. But I will say this, um, the, um, it's like the other issue uh, that that's, that is often compared to it is should you have an independent chair uh, or should the CEO be the chair? Uh, there's been, uh, and I, I remember when Harold Williams was chairman of the SEC back in the middle 70s, and he was the first person to propose that you ought to separate the chairman from the CEO. And unfortunately, he died and it never happened uh, just, just, uh, just recently. I make that point because it's the same kind of story. It all, it all depends on the set of variables that you're looking for. But I do believe in activist investors. I do believe that investors who want to do the right thing can have a constructive role in disciplining management uh, through what's happening to market value uh, of the enterprise. Uh, but, and, and if the good ones are actually encouraging long-termism. So I support the Black Rocks and the Vanguards and I've talked to these folks. Uh, on some of the companies I'm involved with, because I think they're doing they're doing doing the right thing. So it isn't the structure so so much of staggered boards. It is really the quality of the outputs. And if the company is doing very well, then nobody cares. And if it's beating its environmental commitments and the things that it said it would do, nobody's going to care that it's a staggered board. Uh, I'm in a board where uh, we have a designated agreement with uh, labor, for example. Uh, friends, uh, people say to me, how the heck can you have a board with labor on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, as part of the governing body? Well, it's worked out quite well uh, in our regard. It's all about, and I think uh, Professor Edmund said this, it's all about getting thinking around the issues that are going to affect the ability of the firm to do what it was created to do. And stakeholders matter. Let's not kid ourselves uh, in that whole enterprise. And, and so therefore, don't be too hung up on the fact that uh, many of your boards are staggered. Now, if, if, if staggering is to protect a way of thinking uh, and there's no capital and no invention and no growth and people are abusing uh, and the society is closed, then that's not good. Uh, mm -hmm. If you really think about these issues, uh, anyhow, I could go on, <laughs> but let me stop right there. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think the uh, audience here wants to uh, uh, Received their awards. So uh, uh, definitely uh, would like to uh, thank both of our uh, you know, distinguished keynote speakers, uh, Professor Alex Edmonds and Professor Al Osborne uh, for uh, giving us some of their valuable time and insights over here, sharing it with us. Uh, I think uh, we've uh, all uh, greatly benefited from this. And uh, definitely everybody, uh, Who's, who's here, please leave your business card so we can make sure that we uh, get you a copy of Alex Edmund's book uh, once we clear it from customs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Okay. All right. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, uh, Alfred. And now uh, we go to the, uh, what uh, many of you have been waiting for, and we don't want to be that late. And I call on uh, our president, Dr. Mohammed al to come in. And what we're going to do now, as your name comes up, uh, please join us on the stage, take the award, and shake hands with our president. And at the end, inshallah, we'll have the joint.
picture on this uh, stadium. I always call this the best for last. However, I think we have an excellent two speakers who uh, reminded us on the leaders on the board of governments. And as was demonstrated from the data, as well as for the speakers, what corporate governance indeed is, it is profitable. And Alhamdulillah, the culture of corporate governance is growing in Saudi Arabia. And uh, I do believe our center played a role in that, in addition to CMA, which we thank our colleagues in CMA also for enhancing this process. Uh, and we hope this culture will keep going and you will continue to support uh, our center. The center provides a lot of services. You have the agenda, you have the, the brochure on the back page. There are some of the services which the center provides. Please feel free to join us and we'll go from there.